Welcome to the second episode of Coach Me Up. Today I'm here with Daniel Bach. Oh, come on now! Also known infamously as Jump Science. <laughs> Daniel, uh, tell me a little bit about your background, what you do, how you got here. All right, so uh, my background, I would say, actually starts with me being obsessed with basketball when I was 12 years old. Um, I had played a variety of sports, but kind of honed in on basketball when I was about 12. And uh, when I was 13, I started jump training, um, just sort of at random, um, knew a couple exercises that my older brother had done with the weight set that he had in the basement. So I just started doing them, and then I was like, uh, I was jumping in the driveway on an adjustable rim, and um, it just turned into a really wild success story. Yeah. Um, I gained probably a foot on my vertical in a year. Um, and so at that point got kind of obsessed with the whole idea of training, the concept of it. Um, the results are obviously pretty addicting. Yeah. Um, so then, so yeah, when I was yeah 13, I was like really into training already. Um, by the time I was 15, I had continued to like try different stuff. Um, and by the time I was 15, I was like, I think I want to train people for a career. So, uh, so I knew pretty early on that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and then, so after high school, I uh, went into exercise science in college uh, and took a long, slow road through undergraduate school. But while I did that, I uh, started training people. Yeah. Um, started out as just like a couple friends and then um, uh, some other people like saw what was going on, joined in and turned out we had like, you know, ended up with this like um, little jump training squad at, at my university and uh, people saw some really good results. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just kind of started training while I was in college. I think about when I was 20 is when I first started doing that. Um, so I was doing that along with going to school for exercise science. Um, and then also in there, I started um, posting YouTube videos. And so that turned into uh, getting some engagement online, people asking me for help with things, people asking for information, all this stuff. So then it you know, just sort of evolved into, okay, well, let me write this article for some people. Let me mm. write up this program for this person. Um, and just sort of organically turned into uh, a pretty good informational website on sports training. Uh, so yeah, I ended up with training people in person, getting a degree plus this website thing. And, um, and that went on for a few years uh, throughout college and then um, a year after college was when I moved to Texas mm -hmm. uh, from Wisconsin, where I'm from, from Milwaukee, and um, that was in 2014. So I've been here six years now, and uh, now I work at a place called Acceleration, uh, which actually specializes in speed training. So now I have um, a, you know, a good amount of speed training experience as well. Um, I do work with still some volleyball players and basketball players, so I still have that jump training. I'm still kind of like the jump guy at acceleration, but uh, I'm also sort of like the track guy now. Um, where I sort of specialize in the track athletes. Um, so yeah, I've got a good amount of jump and speed training going, and, uh, and it's with mostly high schoolers, even some middle schoolers, and then uh, I do train some college athletes, but you know, only when they're available not that much of the year that they're sure. able to come train with me. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Awesome. So now something that I picked up on that I think is pretty interesting is going from almost solely the jump background and then moving into um, the speed setting. Talk a little bit about the carryover. Like what have you seen from jumps that go and that like apply directly to speed training and vice versa? Um, well, so the, the first person that I trained for speed was actually... Um, uh, a track athlete at my university. This was like at the very tail end of college. And um, at, at that point I had like, you know, read things and talked to people about, about speed training. And it was basically like, well, yeah, you gotta get their strength and power up. Mm -hmm. um, and in his case, um, at the time, I didn't necessarily know a whole lot about like, you know, who needs to get stronger or who needs to like stay away from weights and as far as speed training. but. Um, in in th this guy's case, he was like a pretty obvious case that he needed strength. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he started, you know, just doing like quality squatting, lunging, deadlifting, things like that. And uh, and he like he transformed uh, on the track. You know, he went from 
Um, he was like a very, I would say, you know, average or maybe less uh, 400 hurdler at the D3 level. Um, and then he started training with me in July. And the next season, he was he made it to nationals. He was in the top 20 in the country. <laughs> Um, he took over three seconds off of his 400 hurdles time. Nice. Um, so in, in so in that in that sense, there's a big carryover of you need strength and power. Yeah. Um, that's not you know there is I would say some definite differences between sprint and jump training, but you definitely need that piece in both cases. Um, so yeah, that would be the the biggest carryover was like, and I already had experience with that from the jump training, so there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of difference as far as that side of things is concerned in, in the sprinting. Uh, maybe just a little bit extra concern for uh, hamstring injury prevention, mm. but uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's like you know, get your squat up. It's really really helpful yes. in both cases. Okay, yeah, yep. I love that. So, uh, and you kind of touched on this a little bit as well, but in terms of making decisions uh, for athletes or for who you're training and what they need and what you're seeing, what are some of the guiding principles and philosophies? Um, maybe some of the things that you started off with understanding and what you've grown into now. Right. So, yeah, I would say, you know, coming from the jump chain, training background and then having like that initial experience with speed with, uh, with that, that college athlete and then uh, another friend of mine who was a sprinter there, um, I knew strength was going to be valuable for speed, um, but I could also see sort of the give and take between the two. So actually, the second guy I trained for speed, yeah, like I said, he was a sprinter, and uh, and he, I was training him. Um, boy, he went like he he went to Spain and then he came back. I think he had already, yeah, he was done with his track career, um, but he uh, just came back and was like, hey, why don't we like train this semester and just see what we can do? Um, and then he ended up, I think he did like compete in a meet just unattached. But uh, so while he was training, he wasn't with the track team or anything, and he actually had uh, like. He ended up figuring out that it, he thought it was like a foot injury, but it was actually like a piece of glass was in his foot oh for God. like months. <laughs> so he, he was unable to do like much running. Yeah. Um, we did the lifting and he got a lot stronger and uh, his start got freaky. Yeah. So he, he, without a whole lot of speed training, he went into this meet and he was racing, you know, other college sprinters and the first 30 meters he roasted them. I mean, it was like... I, like I, I was in the bleachers and I put my hands up like what is happening right now? <laughs> he blew him out of the water and then the rest of the race they slowly caught him yeah. um, so you could see that like damn glass caught him right? Yeah. yeah right yeah so you could see he needed more than just the strength of power training he needed a lot more speed a lot more uh, yeah just running volume to, to have that top speed component mm -hmm. um, so I had already started to pick up on that sort of that separation between the two things yeah um, moving down here uh, and, and working with a, a variety of athletes um, from, you know, talented to not talented, from uh, track athletes to lacrosse players to uh, swimmers to, you know, whoever, um, and having them, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're not already been developed for speed for most of their life yeah. necessarily, you know, so, you know, maybe they're 13 or something. Um, I've definitely learn more and more the separation between strength and speed and, and, and if you take someone who's relatively undeveloped um, and like they don't have much of a speed training background and you just make them stronger they may not get a lot of transfer to mm. speed um, so with all that in mind uh, the guiding principles well so I, I've learned to look at um, look at elasticity as being a really important thing and um, so measurements for that being like a flying sprint time would be like your ultimate one if you're looking, if you're specifically trying to train for speed. Other things would be like your RSI test, um, things like hopping for distance or bounding for distance um, and, and looking at that and saying, okay, if this piece is completely lacking um, but, and, and we just get this person strong, it may not produce that much. Of results in terms of speed, at least not outside of the first 10 yards, maybe. Right. Um, so yeah, and, and then also it's you look at okay, how strong are they? How how fast do you think they should be? As it relates given, to their strength, given how strong they are, and if their speed's lagging way behind, 
well, we got to bring it back up, or otherwise continuing to just get stronger is not probably going to produce the best speed results. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen yeah all types of different scenarios and things like that. But yeah, for sure, um, the football guys have taught me like, okay, we get these guys who start lifting pretty consistently in seventh grade. Right. By their sophomore year, they're pretty strong, and they may be pretty fast as well. But they'll be strong to the point where it's like, are they gonna? keep getting faster at this point yeah. and and it's tough a lot of them sophomore year they're as fast as they're going to get yeah from that point they get a little bit bigger um they maybe hold on to their speed maybe they struggle to even hold on to their speed depending on how much weight they're gaining um so yeah in that in that case it's like you gotta you gotta really consider okay is continuing to just squat and clean and bench really serving me best as a football player mm -hmm. um if, you know if i play a speed position like is this really, is this really the best thing for me? Um, so yeah, just just looking at how strong are they, how fast are they, how fast are they specifically in this part of the sprint, and then saying, you know, how do we go from here to where we want to get to? Um, yeah, I guess we didn't didn't cover like specific numbers in there, but that's yeah, okay. Just, I think uh, I I mean what I'm hearing from you is like this concept of being able to recognize what an athlete's good at, what an athlete maybe isn't so great at and give them what they need as it depends for that particular athlete which to me feels like common sense yeah. you know yeah. um and and it's a shame you know i feel like um it it, it can sometimes appear to be uncommon sense yeah. um and what we do um but i think that's that's a fantastic philosophy and i i know that i try and echo that same line of thought no matter who i'm working with so i, mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic and, um uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Okay. Who's your favorite kind of athlete to work with? Track athlete. All day. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. The man didn't skip a beat. Mm. I love it. Absolutely. Um, Tell me why. I mean, okay, so like I love basketball, right? As, as a sport, I love playing it. I, I grew up on it. Um, I really enjoy football. You got some really impressive athletes in football. Yeah. Um, but track athletes, so one, um, they are speed trained. They are elastically trained because that's what the sport is that. Mm -hmm. So they, they have that piece. Um, you know, well, if they're any good at track, they have that piece. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, other, the, the main thing is their sport is athletic development. So mm -hmm. a sprinter, you just have to make them faster. That's their whole sport. Yeah. You could make a football player faster and they're not any better of a football player. Right. Or you can want to make a football player faster, but they're doing 50 other things that just kind of muddy the waters and make it almost impossible. It's a basketball player. I would love to make a basketball player run a 4-440 and have a 40 invert. He's playing three hours of basketball every day. Yeah. It's not possible. Right. It's not, it's not gonna happen. Unless he yeah. just has it naturally from his genetics. You uh -huh. know? Um, and so, yeah, with track, you actually say, okay, here's what we need to do for the next four months. And they can like, maybe sort of be somewhere near where you want them to be whereas football basketball all these other sports you just don't you just don't get that level of uh control that level of um controlling the big picture getting the big picture right um yeah i mean i got definitely have had plenty of football players where it's like i would love if you didn't squat for the next three months but <laughs> right it's not gonna not happen, happen. It's not coach ain't gonna let that happen no yeah not even chest not up even butt a, back not even a love question. it so um <laughs> yeah. so yeah track athletes for sure absolutely awesome so tell me a little bit what tell me a day in the life of you what's the kind of training that you like to do like if you're gonna set up today let's say today you woke up you're like this is what daniel's doing uh okay so i still have you know, my jump training love. Um, I still like to dunk and things like that. Um, but with me having sort of fallen in love with the speed training and, yeah. and wanting to like solve that problem, um, I've actually, in the past five years, I've put a lot more time into that, um, experimenting on myself than I have into, into jumping. Um, so yeah, more commonly, uh, I'm, I'm coming here and either running some short fast sprints or uh, maybe running some like medium intensity, you know, 150s or something like that, 
or I do some trail running out here just to get some easy volume. There's trails right through the woods here. Um, so I'll do that and then, uh, and then go do my, you know, snatching, squatting, uh, yeah, pull-ups, things of that nature, do that, that general strength training. Um, and then, yeah, once in a while I'll dunk. <laughs> yeah. Um, here and there I'll, you know, I'll do like a plyometric, but I still, I still view it as like a piece of the speed training really. Sure. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and I tend to do yeah a couple a couple fast sprinting days per week, and then like some easier running on other days. Um, and then I try to make myself rest on the weekends. Yeah, that's. But yeah, I've done a lot of different experiments on myself as far as speed is concerned. There was a time where I was sprinting uh, 60 meters for five plus reps daily, like in spikes, full effort. Um, didn't. Didn't work. <laughs> yeah, didn't, That's didn't gonna work be my next well. question. Just How'd that go? <laughs> not, not, not great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I learned something. Sure. Yep. <laughs> sure. Yep. Yeah. And I can relate to that in my own, um, my own training background, and and really like, especially for myself, I try not to experiment too much with my my clients or the people right, I'm working right. with. But I know my for me, my own training, my own experience has just been this ongoing experiment. I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm in love with that process. Uh, something came to mind. Tell me, and this is a difficult question, but okay. what's something that you know now about maybe athleticism, training, that you didn't know when you first got into this field that you wish you did? Or maybe what's the most impactful thing you have learned? Hmm. <laughs> oh, man. So many things. Um, huh. If there's, there's more than one, list. I know it's a tough question. I, I'm, I'm running through some options here. Um, okay, so I remember like a really early early lesson I learned was uh, was just that concept of not lifting as much weight as you can all the time. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, so you have a four sets of ten on the day. It doesn't have to be the heaviest set, set of ten you're capable of. Mm. And I remember specifically, this is like in my first year of, of training people, like watching um, some of the college athletes in the weight room be like, Oh, she could be lifting so much more weight. Why isn't she? Um, but what that does is it, it, if you do lift it, like, you know, every workout is as much weight as you can do, you get really strong for about three weeks and then you hit a wall and you won't yeah. get stronger for months probably. Um, which is how I stumbled into actually the whole, uh, you know, fatigue and overshoot thing is I was lifting and I was training other people like lifting way too hard. Um, and so then it would then require at some point like a, a long break from lifting in order for them to see their performance shoot up um, outside of the, the very early stages. Um, so yeah, not always lifting as much as you can, but then in, at the same time that always that, that also led into the, another lesson about uh, about rest and about um, specifically resting from weightlifting um, because it does just seem to have this this long-term impact of like creating this fatigue that you don't necessarily feel coming on and then right. at some point you just realize like man I'm just sucking and I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. Um, it's just the fatigue lurking in the dark. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So there so that so that was another lesson and, and and I know you know that I've talked about rest a lot. Yes. Um, the yes. overshoot phenomenon, uh, uh, the overshoot of myosin 2x and the muscle fibers is like one of my favorite topics. Um, and then, and then, so that's a separate thing from just like weightlifting, but that's just a, uh, you know, overtraining and rest in general. Um, yeah, rest is rest is a big, big lesson I've learned. And then I would just go back to the, um, yeah, the separation between strength and speed. That's one that yeah, I, I kind of caught on to it early on, but just like continue to learn it more and more. And as part of that, it's. You know, there's like this assumption that beginners are going to be really easy to get better. And I just, I haven't found that to be true necessarily. Mm. I think talented athletes that have never strength trained are going to be easy to get better. Yeah. People who don't have a background in speed training, people who maybe are not very talented, they're not necessarily easy to get better because they don't have all the specific abilities for sprinting and jumping in place to start with. Right. And so then you just add general strength to that. It's not necessarily like 
yeah. the, the formula, yeah. you know? Yeah, what, what, in what direction is the strength going? Right, yeah, yes. like they don't even have, yeah, if you don't have that, um, that coordination, that movement pattern, like dialed in, strengthened up, like, you know, you haven't jumped 10,000 times, right. then yeah, you could easily add 30 pounds to your squat and not jump any higher. I mean, I've seen it happen. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, I think there's an assumption there that unless you're really strong, strength is gonna work for you, and it's not always the case. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's super easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. see people, you squat one time and then you jump higher. Like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, or even squat one time and your 40 gets faster. Like, I've seen that happen, um, but it's just not guaranteed. So I think there's always, you always got to be solving that puzzle. Uh, look at that person as a whole. What are all their characteristics that they have? What's their background? Um, and then you just got to, you got to figure out how to move them in the right direction. And it's not always just get their squat and split squat up, you know. Right. There's, there's more to it than that. So, yeah, lots of lessons, though, man, <laughs> for awesome. sure. Uh, Daniel, tell everyone where they can find more information about you, what you do, what you offer. So, uh, jump-science.com is the website. There's a whole lot of free info on there. I'm not even talking about you have to sign up or something. It's just there, and you can go read it. You don't have to give me your email or anything. Uh, and then Instagram, jump.science. That's where I'm... Uh, most active and attentive currently. Um, I might be trying to resurrect my YouTube here coming up. But, here we go. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I went really dormant on it for a while, and then uh, now when I put videos on there, nobody watches them. So, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how to address that situation. But, uh, yeah, 10,000 subscribers, I'll get like 400 views. Okay, so. that's right. They're sleeping on you, man. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> step it up. Yep. Awesome. Well, hey, look, thanks for taking the time today. I'm excited to get into what we have next, uh, which is gonna be a little track workout. Um, so any idea as to what we're gonna do yet or are we just gonna kinda wing this thing? So we are gonna um, treat you as if you are a football player trying okay. to improve your 40 yard dash. That sounds appropriate. Okay, we're gonna time 10, 20, and 40 yard. Okay. Um, and possibly a flying 20 yard, although the 40 might pretty much give us that. Right. Um, depending how long you're accelerating for. Uh, and then based on those results, we'll talk about some things. We're gonna do a little RSI jumping test, um, maybe a hopping or bounding for distance type of thing. So yeah, we'll be uh, exposing your elasticity. Uh -oh. whether, it's, whether it's a lack of it or a, a surplus, we'll find out. But right, right. I'm gonna lean we'll on be, the lack that's side. That's what we, we'll be examining today. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited. Let's get yep. into this thing. All right, cool. All right, man. Awesome. <laughs> Good shit. Side lunge is gonna be the main movement <laughs> today. It's body actually- weight, Body weight only. Yeah, yeah. You might wanna hit yeah. 37. Oof. 100. <laughs> You heard about it, I did over a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, Daniel, looks like you're getting warmed up. Just saying. That shitty right leg. It's like I have, you know, balance my left foot. <laughs> right leg? Not so much. No. No. Bolt ain't got shit on me. Side lunge and ramp. World record. <laughs> <laughs> here. So it's, yeah, so it's not like way in front like the high knee, it's just right here. Just bringing the... Got it. Like so? Okay. 20-ish? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Rapid fire, too. Woo! <laughs> so then... It's gonna progressively add some speed as you do that. So, same drill, but just kind of building up as you go. Okay. Alright. I'm just kind of mad at you. Get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, all right, let's do high skips. Okay. Six of them. Oh boy. I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh. All right. 
Uh, I'd say you're about ready for a uh, two-point stance, 80% effort, sprint about 10 strides. Okay. Say let's do uh, one more of those, scaling up a little bit higher. Okay. Effort level, about 90% maybe. No rush. Start like this. Okay. Feels weird. video you with my phone. Okay, sure. And we'll do it from a three point. We're gonna start the, the time when your hand comes off the ground. Sure. So let's do it. What's a decent, what's a decent 10 time? Uh, I mean, I would say that's pretty decent, honestly. I'm gonna beat that. Uh, I'd say like 170 would be real good for like guys our size. Okay. Yeah. That looks pretty clean. Four nine is like a uh, reasonably fast varsity football player. Uh, if you break, the, like the guys who get into the four sevens on video, yeah, those you're talking about D one receivers. Okay. Like, yeah. They're holding ass. Yeah. Fastest 40 compared to your fastest 20, the back half of it was also 205. Wow. Like if we were to, I mean, we didn't time the 20 when you did the 40, but if we took your fastest 20 and subtracted from the fastest 40. Mm -hmm. um, so now that, that may not have been your best flying 20. Um, you, you know, because you felt like you did slow down a little bit at the end. You're right. popping up. Uh -huh. Okay. But then it's a intense version of that. Okay. How many okay. of those we got? Let's do about six of them. Okay. Your air time to ground time ratio is 2.8. Okay. What does um, that mean? So, so, you spent 0.56 seconds in the air. Okay. You spent 0 0.20 on the ground in order to get there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that ratio. So, uh, definitely you want to be able to hit three. Okay. Um, yeah, like your, your better athletes are going to get hit, hit three. I would say more often than not. But there are some that are, you know, there are some people who are really good athletes from their muscle muscle power. Sure. And then they don't necessarily excel in this. Yeah. Um, and they probably wouldn't excel at top speed either. Um, I have seen I have seen some like counterfeit performers on this mm -hmm. where they're like they hit one rep like real good and get like a real good ratio, but they're not they're still not like great top speed people. So this is not a direct a direct measurement there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a it's an easier, less demanding way to like get a quick measurement on something then like okay let's do flying sprint times you know mm -hmm. that's like whole warm-up process yes. all this stuff like you got to be totally healthy and fresh all this you know um, whereas this is like you can put it in your the end of your warm-up real quick um, but yeah so you're looking at elasticity there is what we're looking at. yeah three is somewhere you probably want to be um, your high level high jumpers will go over four I mean they're you know this almost no time on the ground and then just floating in the air. Yeah. Um, there's a look to it when you see the four. <laughs> the four has a look to it for sure. Um, but yeah, so that's again, it's something that I would say, you know, just doing that test is like a good plyometric exercise. Yeah. At the same time, I wouldn't want somebody to do that test a whole, or like do that exercise all the time and get really good at that. Because then without, it's not even a true test, right? Right. You've gotten what, better at the skill. Right. What you want to do, I mean, if your goal is speed, what you want to do is sprint mostly and hopefully that is developing the test for you got it and you come back to the test once in a while 
and you go, and oh. It's, oh, it's higher because I sprinted 10,000 meters per week the last three months, you know? <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. It, I mean, it is a good plyometric exercise, though, so you could do it. I would, yeah, I would stay away from, like, measuring it all the time because, yeah, you don't want to just get better at the test. Got it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's a good, a good, easy way to look at elasticity. All right, Daniel. So give me the rundown, uh, some of the takeaways that you had from today, some of the things that you feel like I can improve on immediately, um, and maybe some of the things that as we move into the weight room in our next follow-up session here, what that might look like. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, your first priority is you just need to start sprinting regularly. Um, and, and yeah, sprinting like full speed. Um, not a ton of volume on the high effort, but you gotta, you gotta get that piece in there. And there's probably gonna be some level of just coordination improvement from doing that regularly. Um, that would show up within the first couple weeks. Um, then, yeah, a apart from that, I think there's gonna be a more of a long-term investment as far as that, that elastic volume. Yeah. That is probably not, you know, gonna, like, it, if you start it, it's probably not gonna make you faster in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if you were a teenager still, it might, okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it might be a little bit slower there. And, uh, and yeah, I think, like I said earlier, I think at some point you're, you probably have to rest from the elastic volume to kind of get, like, reap the rewards of it. Um, and then I do think that um, s some general strength will still contribute. Uh, I would just say that I would hope it would be like a twice per week type of thing yeah. on the weights. Um, you would want to prioritize speed and try to primarily adapt to that. Um, especially given your background, like you don't have a, like a track and field background or something, and you have a pretty extensive strength training background. Yes. So I would I would try to prioritize the speed and then use the strength as a complement to that. Um, to yeah, hopefully get your adaptations mostly to speed and not have uh, the strength like uh, meddling with it too much. Um, and then again, I would say there there's you know there very well may be a long term investment with the strength, where you're going to do it for eight weeks and then you're going to back off of it. Um, but that would be a, a process you'd want to be guided as you go. You'd want to take measurements as you go to see what influence all these things are having on you. Um, so yeah, if you, you know, if you start start driving your squat up and your 20 yard time comes down, well then great, you know. Yeah. You don't, <laughs> yes. you don't got to do anything too yes. complicated. Yeah. Just yeah. Keep yeah. going with it. Uh, but then yeah, if you do it for eight weeks and now your 20 yard is a little bit slower, it's like okay, well. Yeah. I've gained some strength on my squat. Like I know there's some potential for something to happen there, something good. So that's where you would kind of try to uh, shift back towards the speed, speed side of things. Um, so yeah, I think sprinting fast, getting the elastic volume, and then still adding that strength piece. And that's really, that's kind of the formula I would say for people in general. Yeah. Um, Maybe in different, different quantities for different people. Um, but yeah, you kind of have to look at, at, at those different pieces and then and manage them over time. And, uh, and then I would say the thing we haven't talked about much is just in the background, do your structural work to make sure you stay healthy, which again, probably more important for you than for a teenager. Sure. Um, you know, but yeah, like doing things like ISOs or calf raises or like hip flexor work, you know, like I don't expect you to improve your speed from hip flexor work, but if it's a difference between pulling something and not yes that's huge it's hard to get fast if right. i'm spending a lot of time laying on the side of the track right <laughs> right exactly yeah exactly <laughs> although if you do train for a while really hard and then you get hurt and have to rest for like a week or two then it can be really great sure so that, yes <laughs> that forced rest yeah, but uh right. but yeah so those are kind of the pieces that that i would have uh putting have you put in going forward okay. and uh yeah that's sort of the that's sort of the formula just in different amounts for different people and you always got to um take the measurements along the way and make the decisions based on how things are going. Um, yeah, you gotta figure out the puzzle as you go. Okay. Well, uh, I wanna thank you for today, the opportunity to get out on a track. It's been a while, uh, <laughs> but it was certainly a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to getting into the weight room with you as well. Yeah, man. Um, you got an awesome facility over there. I had the opportunity to check it out. So um, that's gonna wrap things up for today. Thank you for spending time. The next time you'll see me, I'll be with Daniel at his facility uh, and Dripping Springs. All right, so we're at the gym now. We're gonna check out uh, Tim's vertical jump, his broad jump, and then look at some uh, strength movements. All right, so let's get going on the vert. We'll do a standing reach first. Okay. So uh, keep your heels on the ground. Uh, you wanna back up just a little bit. And push through the highest one you can. Okay. 
in the vertex up there, so. Okay, so <clears throat> when executing this, is it best for me to have like a shorter counter movement or like get, or just let it rip? I want you to be purely instinctive. Okay. Yep. Don't think short, don't think long, just jump. Okay. Be competitive. Yeah. <sighs> yes, sir. <laughs> Got the blue one. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Nice. Nice. All right, so we'll give you like five tries probably. Okay. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah, which while you load up, you don't want to look up because uh -huh. you, you'll just, it's okay. not, you're going to hurt your neck. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. But yeah, hopefully like beforehand, you can like look up and, you know, like, okay, I got this. Like, you kind of acquire your target. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <sighs> ah! Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, that's close. Do um, approach jumps as like... Like a part of your testing? Oh or, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so definitely with volleyball. That's, sure. That's like the thing. Um, but then even with other sports, like well, so basketball also they're definitely relevant there. But even for like a football player, I'll do it because I want to see the athleticism. Yeah, uh, and I want I want to know like because I won't give many instructions. I'll be like, all right, just take whatever approach you want. I love that. And I'll see, do they go one foot or two foot, or yeah. do they have no idea what to do, or whatever. Just kind of push me into that. And then, totally. And it's actually a thing that I like to like build in people, even if they're not like jumping athletes. Like I'll have football guys, okay, let's give you like a four foot hurdle and try to clear it, and let's do it left, right, right, left, left, right, all the points. And even though they're not going to, you know, have that specific skill in their sport much, it's just a good athleticism builder. And there are times where they do have to jump, obviously. Yep. Um, they're not going to get to set up an approach, right. but like, yeah, it's just a good, it's a good uh, training stimulus, I think, to be able to jump on all, on all those different plans. So, so yeah, I definitely, definitely include this, or like approach jumps, yeah. Yep. Ah! Not going to get it. <laughs> Tim, let's see it, man. All right, here we go. Okay, it was a 107, so just under nine feet. That was not a maximized landing, though. No, you landed. Ah, yeah, left heel. No. <laughs> Yeah, about 106 and a half or seven. Okay. Yep. Okay. There we go. That was uh, like nine, three and a half. Okay. Yeah, 111 and a half. Ah, I thought that last heel, yeah. Maybe nine, two there. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to be looking at Tim's strength. Uh, Normally I would use a back squat for this. Tim prefers front squat slash has been doing front squat, so we can do that, that's fine. Um, I might have something to say about front squats at some point, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But we're gonna uh, start with a few sets of three, lightweight, and just kind of work our way up to uh, a pretty heavy single rep. that Tim is doing a good job of staying upright in his squat down here. His knees are forward and he's staying tall. He's, and he, as he comes up, he's not uh, shifting forward and throwing his butt back and getting bent over. Um, so that is a sign that he is not weak in the knees. He's able to keep load. Uh, he's able to keep 
resistance torque at the knee and his quads are able to produce the uh, extension torque to stand up without getting bent over. So that's a very good thing. Let's go, Tim. So that rep by Tim there was, uh, you know, maybe not his absolute max, but enough to get an idea of where his max is. Um, and so that's on a front squat. His back squat we could assume would probably be, um, you know, maybe 15% higher than that. Okay, so we can we can work with those numbers. Um, so you do see, and I actually got a video from directly from the side as he gets up to those heavy weights, he does start to have a little bit of a shift forward of the bar and his hips go back, so he's moving more load onto his hips and his back and taking it off of his knees, uh, just for like a little bit of the range of motion there. Um, so I think from talking with Tim previously, like he actually believes he is hip dominant by nature, so that makes sense. Um, at this point, I think that he's trained his quads well enough that he's pretty well balanced out and he's actually got like pretty solid knee extension, knee extension strength right now. Um, you can just, barely see the origins of that hip do dominance in the in the in there uh, when you got to that, that heavy weight yeah. so now what I want to do experimentally is ask Tim to back squat that weight okay and see what it looks like there and what I want us to do is try to back squat like a front squat okay. as upright as you can okay. knees forward your butt's going straight down it's not going back okay all right so that's what I want to see okay Okay, so the common belief with front squats is that it is a more upright, more quad focused lift. Um, what I have seen is with, with a lot of hip dominant athletes is that very well may not be the case. They may actually end up shifting the bar forward in a back or in a front squat just the same way they would in a, in a back squat. So then it ends up being not really a more quad focused lift. But then it is still a weaker lift or if it's the same weight, it's a slower lift. So if you have that situation, then it's like, why would you bother to do a front squat? Other than just like for variety. Mm. There's still nothing wrong with it. But, uh, but yeah, it's like, I don't know if we're really getting anything different out of it that we can't get out of a back squat. It might actually be inferior. Now in Tim's case, because he does front squat very well, um, his bar path on the back squat you know, it was a little bit different than the front squat. And, and so in his case, that it probably was a little bit more quad focused. Hard to put like a real measurement on it without being like in a lab with like 3D motion capture or something like that. Um, but you also have to consider the, the weight went up faster on the back squat. Yeah. So to me, it's like, definitely don't have anything wrong with front squats, but if I want to get you as strong as possible, I think I'm definitely going to lean towards focusing on back squats and I don't think you're losing much of anything from your quads by doing that mm. all right so now we're gonna be looking at some hang power cleans um, using this as a way to look at uh, a hip a hip extension focus lift uh, but also an explosive lift um, comparing that to the squat numbers can be insightful So if you could give me the recap from the time we spent both at the track and here today at acceleration. Okay, so yeah, we want to look big picture for you We're looking at pretty much everything we looked at um, and kind of give you an idea of where you would go if you wanted to be, you know, the fastest and highest jumping athlete possible. Okay, so uh, things we learned today looking at your squat. Um, we're estimating your back squat about 335. Okay, with your weight being at 225. It's a uh, relative strength of 1.49 okay so right about one and a half um, so that is helpful so we would take that type of number and compare it to some of your athletic measurements and then we can say okay you know are, are we more developed in one area or another okay so uh, so I look at that and I compare it to your 10 yard right uh, you being a low 1.7 in the 10 yard 
I would say at that strength level, that's actually pretty fast. Okay. Okay. So that's good. So in, in that department, I would say getting stronger is probably going to help you get faster. I would, I would expect. Um, if we look at your top speed right around nine meters per second, I would say with your height in there, there's definitely potential to have a higher max velocity with that level of strength and your, and the length of your body. Um, so that would be, again, that, that's that, that realm that you haven't really explored a whole lot is basically like training like a track athlete. Okay. So I think that would be, you know, a piece of the puzzle for sure. Um, if we look at your jumps, now these are like borderline. So I would say uh, your vertical t today was 28.5. So the, your vertical, uh, vertical divided by your height is 0.38. So that ratio um, with a one and a half body weight squat, we maybe hope to see that up in the 0.4 or something. However, we know today was not like your freshest day. Right. Um, and so I think we could expect, you know, another inch or two on top of that. And then, then we're in more of sort of that, that 0.4 ratio. And that, again, that's probably about what you can expect with a one and a half times body weight squat. I wouldn't expect that there's like a whole bunch of potential for you to jump higher without getting stronger okay. in that department. Um, broad jump, I would say similar. Uh, it's kind of in that same, same range where it's like, yeah, I mean, there, there's some people who maybe squat one and a half times body weight and can broad jump a little bit further. Um, again, we're looking at compared to your height, okay? Your, your broad jump to your height is about 1.49. Um, you know, so, you know, there are people that go a little bit farther than that, but uh, overall, I wouldn't expect there to be a ton of broad jump potential without getting stronger, okay? Um, and then, if we look at your hang clean, so we got, a, you know, close to a max, about 240, and we compare that to your squat, the, the percentage there is about 0.72 of your back squat or your estimated back squat. Um, so that is a, a decent ratio there. Um, I think that again, if you're more fresh, you're more explosive, that hang clean tends to pop up a little bit. Um, also, if you were training hang clean more consistently, sure, <laughs> right? There's always that specificity factor. Um, and then uh, and then if you if you had maybe a little bit more of a hip focus in your strength training, there would be a potential for that hang clean to be higher like that. Um, but so the, the hang clean, I wouldn't say is indicative of like, oh, he's really not explosive or he's like, you know, way super explosive and the only way to get, get it up is to, uh, is to get stronger. Um, I would say it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like normal, <laughs> that, that ratio. Uh, so overall, considering what you have been doing lately, which is largely just like lower body strength training, yeah. pretty hard, and then what, like playing some basketball and stuff. Um, probably the first thing I would explore would be that top speed department. Um, I would wanna see what can we get out of, yeah, having a month of being like a track athlete and maybe not lifting very much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just not because you have, again, like the, a ton of potential to get way faster without lifting, but just because you've been lifting lately. Yeah. And you could probably just use a little shift, a little shift towards the fast end of the spectrum and just like, uh, and, and just, yeah, get a little bit more fresh since you've been kind of grinding on bodybuilding stuff lately. Yes. Um, so I'd probably, you know, if it was up to me, I'd probably explore that first and actually back off the strength training. Then you say, you go in, you say, okay, now I'm fresh. I've been sprinting, so you know I'm, I'm in like sprinting mode. I got some elasticity built up. Now let's go back and add some strength. And now I'm expecting really good potential from that strength training. And that is where I would expect, okay, now we're hoping that 10 yard comes down. Now we're hoping that broad jump goes up. Now we're hoping that standing vert goes up um, when you add that strength. Because yeah, all those things are, are th those measurements are all, I would say, pretty good for how strong you are. So I would expect you to get a good response then if you do get stronger in those measurements. Um, but yeah, I would just like to see you kind of like freshen up and, and just get explosive first since you have been, you know, lifting consistently lately. Um, so yeah, that's my big picture interpretation of you as an athlete. Awesome. I love <laughs> yeah. it. So a, a couple of questions come to mind. The first thing is like in transitioning from kind of the lifting and pickup basketball thing I've been doing lately, and then like moving into like a period of time where I am working on elasticity, mm -hmm. what would like a week look like or how, what's step one? Step one um, would be, let's get a, a full speed sprint day. 
Okay. Um, and I would, I would want to get that twice per week. I might not do that the first week. First week might be, let's do it once and then we're gonna have another day where we're about 90%. We're just kind of taking it easy. Just because sprinting is a thing that people have hurt themselves doing, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and particularly, you know, you get to 30 years old, like you gotta be a little more cautious about stuff like that. Sure. So, um, so yeah, I would, but eventually where I'm trying to get to, or not eventually, you know, week three where I'm trying to get to is two fast days and then two volume days. Okay, and those volume days, so it'd be like Monday fast, Tuesday volume, Thursday fast, Friday volume, something like that. Um, and those, those volume days are not conditioning. Those are accumulating foot contacts, but hopefully not in an exhaustive manner. Okay, Okay. so I think we talked about that previously where it's like that's yes. the 100 meters times eight at 75% or maybe that's a little trail run 30 seconds at a time, or maybe it's throwing a football in Zilker and running routes, right? right? It's something that's not as intense as like full speed 40 yard or full speed 60 meter or something, but you're still accumulating those elastic foot contacts. Um, also included in there would be your, your um, low intensity plows, right? You're hopping, you're skipping, things like that. That's all elastic volume, that's all good. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I'd be looking for four days probably. Um, and, then, and then that would be, okay, let's get to that point you know, build up to that point over the course of three weeks, then let's sustain it for three, four weeks, then let's take a major, like let's do only work out twice one week. Like have a, have a, a, like a recovery week. Um, and then plan on, plan on having a recovery week, you know, once a month probably. Um, because yeah, that, when you do that, that volume adding up, it doesn't like wear you out really, but there's this, that you just end up a little flat. Yeah. And so then it just helps to like have a really easy week where you're like, don't work out that much um, like here and there. Um, then, and again, this is much more important for guys our age, you got to think about your health. Mm. So two big things, uh, Achilles and hamstrings, got to be thinking about with sprinting. So we're not going to abandon calf work. Um, I would ask you probably like, have you been doing full range of motion calf raises for the past six months? And if so, then maybe we'll just go with like some ISOs, um, some like, you know, more specific calf work. If you've been completely neglecting it, then I'd be like, okay, well let's do some like sets of 20 calf raises like deep, you know? Um, so yeah, we'd want to address the Achilles and then the hamstrings as well. Um, and that's one where, okay, so if you hadn't been training hamstrings, I would say, well, let's start doing some hip hinges. Mm -hmm. Um, make sure we have some structure built up there. In your case, I know that you've probably been doing plenty of hamstring stuff. Yes. So I'd be saying let's let's cut it down then to again um, like some more specific or what I would call like less disruptive hamstring work. So that real long stretching out the hamstrings um, strength training can be you know a little bit disruptive for speed because it's very non-specific. So I'd be saying okay maybe we do. Um, uh, Alex Natera hip uh, running specific isos right yeah that, that straight leg hip extension for the hamstrings uh, maybe do a maybe just a hamstring curl uh, or, or you could do a Nordic curl um, yeah so it'd be stick sticking with like those less disruptive hamstring options um, so those would be added on to the to those running days those sprints and running so just to make sure you try to stay healthy um, yeah so that'd be about where I'd be trying to get you is that was that everything? Yeah. yeah well, you, you answered something uh, before I could ask it. Is like, what role during that period of time when we're working on elasticity does strength right. play? Like, where does it does it have a place? And if so, what for? And you, you kind of hit the, the nail on the head. I think it's largely for health. Yes. Okay. Yep. And then I mean, I, I would also be thinking about like your your you know you just your full body power. Like for for example, your hand clean, um, and that would be something that's not disruptive you could easily hang clean once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. And that would be sort of your measure of uh, what is my strength doing right now? So if, if your hang clean's dropping off while you're going through this process, we would say, oh, we probably need to put in like a little, just a little bit of strength, Sure. right? Um, if you're hang on, if it's maintaining, then you're like, okay, I'm good. I can keep, keep doing this and I don't have to worry about my strength falling off. Um, the other thing I'd bring to mind there would be like, you know, uh, some plyos, some jumps would fit in there. And again, that's a, it's a strength indicator. It's also a strength maintainer, right? Mm. So, okay, if you test your broad jump every week and it's 
staying consistently the same, you know your strength isn't dropping off, or at least not like your meaningful strength. Um, at the same time, if you're doing, let's say, let's say you're doing rhythmic broad jumps for a plyo on your speed day, like after your sprints, mm -hmm. um, that is a strength stimulus. It's not a deep squat max out, sure, but it is a strength stimulus, and it's something that will help you hold on to your strength. Um, so yeah, I'd be thinking sprints, plyos, a little bit of hand clean, and if everything is, if those those measurements are staying solid, then you don't have to like rush back into lifting real right away. You could, you know, you can afford to see where can this speed thing take me right now? Where can the sprinting take me? Um, yeah, now if those things start dropping off, that's where it's like, all right, maybe we gotta do like a two third squat, you know, yeah, like just yeah. something to, or maybe some, even just some lunges or something, um, just to keep, hold on to that strength a little bit. Honestly though, I suspect like with your training background, I, I bet you would not drop off much at all. Yeah. I bet if you did sprints, plyos, hang clean, um, you, you probably maintain, you know, your hang clean, your broad jump, stuff like that. I, I doubt your power would drop off much at all. Daniel. That was awesome, um, expertly laid out. Uh, real quick, just to sort of wrap everything up, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Uh, so my website is jump-science.com. Uh, there's a lot of free information there. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. It's totally free, you don't even have to sign up. Um, and then social media, Instagram is jump.science. That's where I'm the most active. Uh, yeah, follow me. Awesome, hey, thank you. This is fun, Tim.